Okay, so welcome to this next video in uh, the Glutamate Signaling Playlist. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a really important topic in all of neuroscience and involving glutamatergic synapses, which is long-term potentiation. And long-term potentiation is so important in neuroscience because at the moment, it's the best model we have for memory. Okay, so what do I mean by memory? Well, I mean that uh, when you go, if what you do uh, today, you will be able to remember what you can do, what you have done. If something just happens to you, you can, that experience remains with you. Now, how? What's the neurobiological mechanism of that? Uh, well, one theory, one view used to be that maybe uh, the uh, maybe the information was just reverberating around the brain continuously. So for instance, if you get some sort of auditory information in, let's say you hear something, let's say someone says hello to you, okay, and you are just taking in that auditory information. So let's suppose you only have one sense and that's the um, that's the sense of audition. So they say hello to you and you're going to remember that they have said hello to you, okay? So here you are. Well, basically, what's going to happen is that the, um, the sound of them saying hello to you is going to be processed by your ear, and it's going to be turned into a combination of action potentials. So the information of the sound is encoded by some sort of combination of action potentials by the ear. And that combination of action potentials is sent to auditory cortex, and the auditory cortex then uh, realizes that someone has said hello to you. But how do they then? How does the auditory cortex remember that someone has said hello to you? Well, maybe that uh, combination of action potentials just goes round and round and round in the brain, and is maintained forever. So the idea is that the information is just going round and round in your brain forever, basically, and that's potentially uh, how memory works. Uh, basically, we can show that that is not the case, and the reason we can show that that is not the case is there's two reasons. Firstly, um, basically, people who have survived barbiturate, over, barbiturate overdoses um, give us some evidence that that is not the case, because people who take huge levels of barbiturates, uh, such as phenobarbital, so an example of a barbiturate is phenobarbital, uh, they're used as kind of a drug of abuse, they're very, very strong, and they, uh, they produce a similar effect to alcohol, basically. Okay, so uh, people who take barbiturates and overdose on them, basically what happens is that their brain completely stops, basically. Um, so their neurons actually stop firing uh, if they overdose on this. Now, some people actually manage to survive that. And people who do survive barbiturate overdoses, where the brains have stopped firing, um, they, they, their memories are intact. So that shows us that it can't be this continuation, that, you know, this continual reverberation of combinations of action potentials that is storing memory, because those, conti those um, continual reverberations of action potentials would have been stopped by the barbiturate overdose, basically. And you, therefore, you would expect barbiturate overdose to produce complete loss of memory, and it doesn't. They still have intact memory after a barbiturate overdose. Okay. So that's one of the um, that's one of the pieces of evidence in favour of memory not being uh, this reverberation of the combination of action potentials uh, that encodes the um, the stimulus. Okay, another piece of evidence is that people who have epileptic seizures, severe epileptic seizures, and survive those. Um, they still have intact memory, and basically in epileptic seizures what happens is that all the neurons just start firing, uh, it's in synchrony, okay? So that too, an epileptic seizure would also, um, would also destroy, you know, continual reverberations of combinations of action potentials, because basically it would just override it, and all the neurons would start firing in, um, in synchrony, so you'd lose your uh, continual reverberation of patterns of action potentials, because the patterns would just be replaced by all of them firing at once, basically. Okay, and basically, people who survive epileptic seizures, again, they have intact memory, so that shows us that memory is not just you are maintaining the information in your brain going round and round, this combination of action potentials going round and round forever. That's not how memory works, and those two pieces of evidence show us that. 
So there must be some structural change on the level of the brain that encodes the information of a memory, basically. But that's very, very difficult because memories are made instantaneously. So are we getting instantaneous structural changes on the level of the brain? Well, basically, long-term potentiation is a very, very fast change in the structure of synapses, and therefore it's a very good, um, it's a very good um, hope uh, for a mechanism by which memory may well work. Uh, it's also found, the, the place where we found long-term uh, potentiation is in the hippocampus, which is a portion of the brain that we know is very, very involved in memory. So we suspect that this is hugely involved in uh, the neurobiology of memory. Okay, right, so what is long-term potentiation? Because after that grandiose discussion of memory, long-term potentiation in itself is actually a very simple principle. So, okay, let's take a glutamatergic synapse here. So let's take our presynaptic neuron here, which is ending with its axon terminal here. So this is the axon terminal, okay, and here's the axon. And this basically is going to be a glutamatergic uh, axon terminal, so it's going to release glutamate. So here are uh, synaptic vesicles, which are going to contain glutamate. So these are synaptic vesicles, which will contain glutamate. Okay, and now let's draw the postsynaptic cell. So let's draw a dendritic spine, which is this portion, this sort of little process that comes off of a dendrite of a neuron. So here is the dendrite of the neuron. Right, okay. So let's discuss the actual process of, uh, synap um, of uh, synaptic transmission across this synaptic cleft here. Okay, so an action potential arrives at this axon. And that triggers, well actually, shall we go through the process, yes. Uh, so the action potential arrives, so let's say um, this portion of the membrane is going through an action potential here. Okay, so that means that uh, the membrane becomes depolarized, and it allows sodium ions into the cell, basically. So you have a lot, a bit of sodium in here. And that's leading this, uh, the electrical potential difference across this membrane, i.e. from the extracellular to the intracellular, to now be plus 40 millivolts. Okay, so basically the intracellular aspect is plus 40 millivolts of the extracellular compartment. <coughs> okay, so uh, now some of this little bit, some of these sodium ions that brought this positive electrical charge into the cell and depolarized the cell membrane to plus 40 millivolts, some of those will diffuse into this neighboring portion of the membrane and they basically will cause this initial depolarization of the membrane. Okay, so uh, let's draw this as a graph. So uh, basically, if we have time on this axis here, okay, and then we have the electrical potential difference uh, from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. So remember what that means. That means if a little man stands in the extracellular compartment and measures the electrical potential, and then he moves into the intracellular compartment and measures the electrical potential again, what we want to know is how much has it changed, basically, from going from extracellular to intracellular. So basically you take what it is in the intracellular and you subtract off what it was in the extracellular. Okay, and usually what you get is that the intracellular is, uh, the electrical potential in the intracellular compartment is lower than in the extracellular compartment, and it's lower by negative 65 millivolts. So usually what happens is this piece of uh, membrane over here, the electrical potential difference across it is negative 65. Now, if these sodium ions are diffusing into this portion of the intracellular compartment from this uh, neighboring portion of the membrane, what's going to happen is that they're positively charged. So they're going to bring positive charge into this portion of the intracellular compartment here. That's going to raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. Therefore, if this little man now does the same experiment, he measures the electrical potential in the extracellular and then goes into the intracellular, well, the intracellular electrical potential is now more positive. So the amount by which, um, <coughs> excuse me, the amount by which the uh, intracellular compartment is lower than the extracellular compartment, gets smaller, so you get a depolarization. And basically, if the electrical potential is depolarized to a threshold potential, which is usually negative 40 millivolts, uh, which is the threshold potential for voltage-gated sodium channels opening, then what happens is that voltage-gated sodium channels in this membrane, which I'll draw here, are going to open, basically. So, 
uh, this is a voltage gated sodium channel here that I'm denoting. So this is a voltage gated sodium channel and that's basically going to open if the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane uh, gets to, um, gets to uh, minus 40 millivolts basically. Now when that opens, that's going to allow uh, sodium ions to um, come into the cell. Okay, uh, so sodium ions are going to come into the cell through this channel here. So in comes sodium ions through this voltage-gated sodium channel. And basically that current of sodium into the cell is going to uh, depolarize the cell further. And what's going to happen is that you're going to get the upstroke of the action potential. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.